Welcome to the smart business revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? You say you want a revolution? Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the smart business revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right. Welcome, everyone. John Corcoran here. I'm the host of this show, and thank you for joining us for this guest. I'm really excited today. I've got a great guest. And if you are new to the program, of course, go, go check out our archives. You can go to my website, smartbusinessrevolution.com, or your podcasting app of choice and check out. We've got some great episodes with CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs, ranging from Netflix to Kinko's, YPO, EO, Activation Blizzard, Lending Tree, and many more. And I'm also the co-founder of Rise25, where we help connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects. And my guest here today, her name is Cindy Norcutt. She is the owner of a multiple award-winning recruitment agency based in South Africa, Durban, South Africa. It's called Pro Talent. She started it about 30 years ago. She's also the founder and chairperson, chairperson of a charity foundation called the Robin Hood Foundation, which does exactly as you would imagine. Um, and we'll talk about that as well. She's also a motivational speaker and author of a couple of books, including How to Be Unstoppable and How Does She do it. So we'll talk about that and surviving some of the different ups and downs of the last couple of years. And of course, this episode, like all brought to you by Rise25, where we help B2B businesses to get clients referrals and strategic partnerships with done via podcasts and content marketing. I get to talk to interesting, smart people like Cindy all the time. And if you are interested in doing that as well, you can go to our website to learn how to do it at rise25.com. Um, all right, Cindy, um, it's such a pleasure to have you here today. And we were chatting beforehand about the origins of your company 30 years ago. Um, what were you doing at the time? What inspired you at 23 years old to start a company that became a recruitment agency? Hi there, John. Thank you for, for having me here. Yes, I think at 23, I, I was working for a recruitment company. And I think you can really attribute it to the possibly the naivety and ignorance of youth. I, I was running somebody else's business, but only doing certain aspects of it. And I remember thinking, I can do this on my own. And uh, I took the plunge and I started up with literally no money. Uh, I didn't even have a computer when I started my business. And um, I just uh, connected with my old clients and um, I got out there networking and just tried to offer a different, more personal um friendly, uh, more responsive service. And uh, literally from day one, it, 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 it somehow took off. I think it was the right place and the right time. And yeah, yeah it's been a 29 year journey of lots of ups, lots of downs and um, lots, of, uh, lots of joy too. I must say, I've absolutely loved the entrepreneurial trip. Yeah, um, I have such a similar story because it was a similar story for me. I was working, practicing law for a law firm and I looked around and I was like, hold on a second, I'm kind of doing this, I, I, you know, I'm not getting much supervision here. Uh, I could do this very well on my own and literally open up an office one flight up in the same building. So my commute went up, <laughs> by, one yeah, <laughs> went up by one flight and yeah. I felt like everything was kind of exactly the same. But then I quickly, and, and kind of like you, like I felt, initially that it was like, oh, it can't be this easy. Like I, I made more money the next month because it was like I was bringing all that money myself. And then I realized, okay, if I go on vacation, no one else is answering the phone. I got to answer the phone. So talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you experienced in those early days uh, as you experience growth. Sometimes that can lead to bigger challenges. Absolutely. I think for me, the first, the hardest part of running uh, my own business, having obviously obviously started young was uh, not really understanding about people management you know thinking hoping and thinking that people would be like me so managing people with different uh, styles different approaches different work ethics that was quite difficult because I tended to avoid conflict so I kind of would hope that problems would fix themselves rather than myself actually being assertive I think the other issue that was a real problem for me as well was uh, not really understanding accounting and business accounting. Um, uh, you know, even just learning how to read an income statement and a balance sheet and 
you know, working out, you know, you know, I think a big question startups have is, okay, if I'm making money, where's the money? You know, yeah. in the beginning, it was often in debtors or, you know, it, it wasn't in the bank all the time. And, um, you know, just trying to grow everything on a shoestring all the time mm -hmm. and often feeling quite lonely. I think that was another challenge, you know, um, all my friends were uh, working in jobs and they finished at five o'clock in the afternoon and chilled. And uh, I always seem to have this weight of this business on my shoulders. And, and I feel it makes you grow up quickly mm -hmm. and it can aid you as well because there is no letting it down. As you say, there is no holiday. There is no um, time where you can actually say, well, um, you know, um, I'm free or I'm absolved of the responsibility of this organism and then obviously of the staff that you employ as well and the clients you serve. Yeah. And in those early days, did you have others that you could turn to? Were there, you know, others in your family or friends that had any businesses that could understand what you're going through? You know, I think, I think I count myself so blessed because, um, I did a business course. I was in business two years and my accountant kept saying to me, you're doing well despite yourself. And apparently that wasn't a compliment. So <laughs> I did a business course on how to run your own business. And the weirdest, this is the, the coolest story, I think. But the, the trainer at the time was a man by the name of Andrew. And I'd known him for years, like just through in our community. And he, he, he spoke to me the one day and he said, listen, uh, I want to mentor you for as long as it takes. And I said, what do you mean as long as what takes? And he said, I want to mentor you for as long as it takes for you to see the seeds of greatness that I see in you. And I remember rushing to the bathroom, looking at myself in the mirror. There were no seeds of greatness. All I saw were veins and mascara in my eyes. Mm -hmm. But um, I, this started a, an interesting relationship for about five, six years. We, we used to meet up once a month for coffee at his training center. And he was always reading books ahead of me. He was always... I don't know, he somehow seemed to be ahead of the curve um, in terms of he was he was listening to the great minds before I was. He, he would come up with business concepts. He would ask me challenging questions. So I think he was a coach to me before coaching became the end thing. And, you know, every time I left his offices, I'd, I'd leave so inspired. I'd have all these new ideas and thoughts that I had never thought before from somebody who wouldn't actually even accept a uh, Ascent for for helping me, but just somebody who sort of saw in me something that must have been there, and um, as a result, the weirdest irony was. So I mean, at the time that I did the business course, I didn't even know what a break even point was. They asked me, and I said, I don't think they have one in my industry. <laughs> <laughs> and about six years later, having studied coaching and having learned a lot more, I ended up buying his training center to start training entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's just insane how how much growth must have had to have happened <laughs> in that time. But I attribute a lot of it to him. Just mm -hmm. this, um, this person who didn't really have any connection to me, who just saw what he saw in me. And to be honest with you, it's something, one of my best things I'm proudest of is having been able to pay that for to other people who have seen, wait, you've got seeds of greatness and, you know, mentoring and coaching disadvantaged people, people who's, who, who don't have the money, people who've got a great uh, story. And, and so I, um, that's been a beautiful part of my journey is, has been um, being able to pay forward what, what Andrew did for me, at, at, you know, when I was around 25 to 30. And, you know, many people struggle with that idea of how do you find a mentor who's going to take you under, take you under their wing and show you the ropes, guide you. It sounds like in a sense, he found you. Yes. Although you did put yourself out there because you were, you didn't stay at home. You didn't just run your business to put your head down. You actually went and attended his course. So what do you say to people who are looking for that kind of mentorship relationship? Okay. I have, I have very strong feelings on this because one thing that I have had to deal with probably almost every week of my career has been people who've emailed me and said, hi, guess what? You are so lucky. I've chosen you as my mentor, which means that they, they feel they can ask, you know, countless questions, meet you for coffee, have you pay for, for it. So I think if somebody identifies somebody who um, could be their mentor, or who they feel that they have a, a kinship with, or they would aspire to, 
I think I think the approach needs to be um, quite intelligent. So not just saying you're my mentor, help me, but maybe say you're a mentor for me, or I'd like you to be in this particular area. And also, it doesn't have to be in person. You know, a lot of people want to meet you. Um, you know, a lot of it can be answered via email. And I'd also encourage people to have to maybe pick mentors in different areas. So, for instance, myself as a parent, if I were to pick somebody as a parenting mentor or somebody as a relationship mentor, as a marketing mentor or business ownership mentor. And I do think an important thing is to be able to say to a person, how can I pay you or how can I compensate you for your time? Or is there anything I can do for you? Because I feel a lot of people who need a mentor, uh, it's it's one way. It's one way. They only want to receive, and they they're not very. They, they, it hasn't even entered their minds that there could be some form of reciprocation. I also think there's a really cool concept called reverse mentoring, where a young person might not have great business skills, but they might have incredible social media skills, or um, you know, where they could maybe even offer that mentor to say, you know. I don't know if you need any of these things, but I can do the following or I could help you with the following. So I do encourage people to find mentors. I think it's brilliant because you don't want to make the mistakes that others have made. And some people have learned so much from those, those mistakes and the hard times that they all they want to do is share. So like I'm part of a group called EO, the Entrepreneurs Organization, and we, we are like a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship group. And I've learned so much from the, from those people. So, you know, if, if if somebody could get into a place like that, I'd say that's great. But there are also a lot of commercial coaches out there who offer tremendous value. So I, I definitely think um, I recommend mentorship, but I think uh, it needs to be approached in the right manner. And yeah. bearing in mind, most people who are approaching a successful business person need to understand that if they have identified that successful business person as, a, as an inspiring leader, many others have as well. So you, you probably are going to get a lot of no's as well because mm -hmm. a lot of people, they, their scarcest um, um, commodity is their time and their energy. So it's not that they're mean or, or rude. It's just sometimes they just don't have the capacity to take on another person. Uh, you, your company has been around for about 30 years and for about two thirds of that time, you've had the Robin Hood Foundation, which you started. So first of all, what is the Robin Hood Foundation? And secondly, why did you start it? And what role has it played for you over the last 20 years, having run you know, both of those things? So the Robin Hood Foundation is an NPO. It's a nonprofit organization. It's a charity. And you know, it's funny, John, because for years, um, I was one of those people who thought, you know, one day when I have time, I'd like to make a difference. I'd like to leave a legacy. And it started um, nearly 18 years ago when my second daughter was born. And I realized, gosh, I could clothe 10 babies for a year with what I've got for this one child. And, you know, South Africa is such a, um, an unequal society. And, you know, I really have felt this burden of, you know, the burden of privilege where you feel like you, you've you worked hard and you've got a lot, but around you, there are people who don't have much. So uh, as the name suggests, I started the organization called the Robin Hood Foundation. We don't steal, but we ask nicely. We, we take from the rich and we give to the poor. And I think um, the fundamental basis of this was when I started this charity, I actually went to all my clients, all my business associates uh, and my friends um, and the community who know me. And I said, this is what I want to do. I want to do something transparent. We we actually take from people who've got extra and we then put the, the, the goods into the hands of the poorest members of society. So it's transparent, it's honorable, it's ethical, and um, you know, it's 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 going where the needs are. There's no middle manning it, there's no um so so we have now one employee, but for I think about seven years, it was everyone was just a volunteer. And now we all just volunteer our time. We use our skills where necessary. And um, yeah, we've built um, four creches. We've hosted some incredibly awesome, inspiring entrepreneurial conferences for up to a thousand people at a time, which have been free for disadvantaged people where they get to, to hear the, the most incredible minds in our country. And for me, it's, it's giving dignity to people who are poor or disadvantaged by allowing them the opportunity to 
to be treated with, with um, absolute uh, dignity and kindness, and they meet the top minds in the industry that they would never normally meet. So I think it's giving them something to, to aspire to. We also run other projects, building houses, and we, we, we help moms with, uh, you know, brand new babies with clothing. We do a lot of food relief, a lot. Um, we had to segue into the disaster relief space during COVID, during um, a looting period that we had in, in, our, in our province and during the recent horrific flooding uh, scenario. So we pretty much are unstructured opportunists looking for opportunities to um, make a difference in the community. And yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's incredibly exciting and yeah. um, very rewarding. I want to ask about the the looting and the flooding that you mentioned um, more recently. But before we get to that, 12 years ago, there was legislation that passed that uh, you said, in your words, nearly broke the recruitment industry. So what was that that impacted you and, and what was that experience like for you? So up until about 12 years ago, my recruitment company was not really focused on permanent placements, but on temporary staffing. So what we had was many companies started outsourcing their staff to recruitment agencies. So there was this, uh, you know, they had their permanent staff and then massive pools of temporary staff that were, were outsourced to recruitment agencies. And then there was a labor, labor law um, amendment that came out quite um, within a very short space of time, which said that companies couldn't do that. Uh, there were only very few circumstances where they could do that. So many recruitment agencies were built only on that model where they, they supplied these outsourced teams, which literally overnight, I'd say half my competitors literally um, had to close their doors. Um, what was great for us was not that we saw it coming, but we had decided to do a, a shift in our business probably about six, seven years before we were pushing less temporary, more permanent, less temporary, more permanent. So every year we were veering towards that um, you know, only placing more permanent staff. And that's, so by the time we had that change in legislation, we were probably about 60% on the permanent staff. So that helped us to um, weather that storm, you know, and and that, that thank heavens, because otherwise I think we could have been a casualty like many of our competitors were at the time. Right. But I think it was maybe just, I don't want to say there was a, a, a like a crystal ball, but I think it was, you know, I think sometimes when you've been in a game a long time, you you develop instincts that somehow just through osmosis, you just have a gut feel. And mm -hmm. I really believe in following those. Yeah, of course, a couple of the more recent events that have happened to you probably weren't as easy to um, anticipate. So, you know, COVID, for example, um, I don't I, you know, a lot of people weren't prepared for that. You said there was a sudden instance of looting. Sounds like it was um, kind of sudden. It wasn't uh, something that people saw coming. Um, what has that been like for you and for your company? COVID was horrific. I think, I think you know, being told within a few days, go home, close up your business. And um, as an agency, I remember we were sitting with 106 job orders, which was quite busy. And within, I think, three days, we went down to zero. And it was like that for five weeks. We literally didn't have a business. And then when we did go back to the office, it was like starting from zero. Uh, it felt like it was an apocalyptic time because there was just no business. And I think for, for me as a business owner, who's always been, I don't know, pretty self-assured and um, always have a plan, always a plan A and a plan B and a plan C and sitting there going, I have no idea what is going to happen. And also, if you think about it, the commodity we sell are people <laughs> and nobody wanted people and people mm. carry a virus. So, you know, so we, I must say, I found it an incredibly stressful time and, and I've never felt so uncertain and so sort of anxious and going like, what can we do? What can we do? Um, Within four months, it did auto correct itself. But you know, you can never sort of make up money you've lost as such. Mm -hmm. But I think it took its toll on clients. It took its toll. A lot of companies cut deep, and they cut they cut a lot of staff. Um, it it led to to sort of like a an avalanche of of unintended consequences where there is suddenly more unemployment. So as a result, at, at the same time as trying to 
run my business, I, as a, as a motivational speaker, was also trying to motivate people through free webinars and just trying to s apply a little bit of positivity and, and pragmatic sort of thinking. And, and at the same time, getting call upon call at our agency, uh, I mean, at our charity, from people who are saying, I've lost my job, I've lost everything. So that it, it ended up being like a triple whammy emotionally, I, I would say, like we, you know, every day you just felt like I just don't have enough capacity for what the world needs of me. And then the looting came out of the blue. Um, and yeah, it was and horrific. I, I wanted to yeah. ask about that because I grew up in Los Angeles and, um, and I was there when the LA riots happened in the early 1990s yeah. and um, totally bizarre you know, bizarre experience going through that. I was fortunate that my family lived kind of an outlying suburb. So it was, it was still happening. You know, we could, yes. you, you know, obviously it was unfolding not too far away, but, but what was that like for you when that, when those, that looting happened, was it close to you? It, in, it was, yes. I mean, you could hear sort of, uh, uh, you know, when they, they, they burnt big storage units um, near where I live, um, and and many of our clients were taken out. Literally, they 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 lost everything. And I think I think what it did was it it it, it showed sort of a, a face of anarchy that that led to a lot of a, a huge drop in business confidence. Um, it led to a lot of distrust of human nature, you know. And I think a lot of people felt quite insecure. Are we in the right province? Are we in the right country? Could this happen again? Why did it start? You know, what 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 stops it from happening again? And for the second time since COVID, we had a drop in business. We literally everybody froze. I think everybody went into a shock mode, and a lot of clients adopted the wait and see approach. Um, let's just wait and see how this unfolds. So it took a huge dent into business confidence, and um, so almost like another knock that we didn't really need or or we certainly hadn't anticipated and then in may this year we had a horrific flooding incident in in our province as well so um what happened was um uh, roads got washed away biz businesses homes um a lot of infrastructure was damaged so people were were reeling yet again and it was almost like a just one knock too many for many people you know and and as a result, again, um, clients were saying, oh, let's wait and see. Um, on the charity side, people were phoning saying, we need food. We were distributing mattresses and linen and clothing. And um, it, so it just feels like the last, since COVID, it's been one obstacle after the next obstacle. And for many people, they haven't recovered. Um, for many people, it's been an emotional journey. It's been, it's been um, there's a lot of... Um, evidence of anxiety and depression and and people being quite uncertain of the future but I think that's where entrepreneurs have to somehow find within them the well of resilience and and optimism that makes us entrepreneurs where you go you know tomorrow will be better and I will be part of making tomorrow better so I think for us it's been a case of digging deep saying how how many people can we help what can we do but John, an interesting thing that's happened, which was definitely an unintended consequence and something I never foresaw, was prior to COVID, if you owned a recruitment agency, you kind of placed people around you. And I think this, this new digital world we live in and has, has opened up. So we are getting companies all over the world hiring South Africans to work remotely. And um, so for a country where the GDP isn't growing very, very quickly, and there are not that many opportunities from companies inside. Um, uh, as a recruitment agency, we are placing people to work in South Africa around the world. And companies that have started in South Africa and have moved to the UK, the US, Australia, they love the South African work uh, ethic. And um, often they relate well to South Africans. And some of them are working in towns where people are not willing to work for whatever reason, maybe the rates aren't great. And we are finding that the global market has opened up uh, to, to South African employees who, who have got good skills, especially in the fields of IT, um, customer service, uh, project management, um, uh, sales, uh, business development. So it's, it's been a, a very interesting, unprecedented um, shift, which, which has been very exciting. 
have you had to change or innovate or pivot your your business model as those needs of the market have changed? Absolutely. So, I mean, beforehand, our, our, our office was like a train station having people in and, in and out for interviews. Everything is done online now. So um, I think we are equally equipped to place somebody within five kilometers of our business as we are to place somebody internationally. The same principles apply, the same processes. So, so yeah, it's just it's just opened up the world in a, in a way we had never imagined. So, yes, we've had to... Um, invest in in um all the infrastructure all the it um in all the systems um in in good databases and in a lot of training but um now i feel we 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 are i think the sky's the limit yeah and the other thing is we used to always only have staff in the office you remember those good old days where (laughs) everyone was in the office now we've we've also taken on freelancers and and they are incredibly hardworking and um self-motivated and you know, they come in the office when they want to, but uh, we also have realized that we can hire people around the country or the world um, to work in our business. So yeah. um, that's really opened up opportunities. Now, um, one of the challenges you've experienced, other businesses have experienced is um, people get poached. You have incoming people calling, um, trying to recruit people out to go work for their company. Um, with labor so fluid now and with people kind of jumping different roles, um, what have you done or what have you advised other companies to do in order to make your company somewhere that people want to stick around? I think um, this is possibly one of the biggest challenges for companies in the knowledge economy going forward, you know, service businesses, um, you know, jobs where, where people can be quite fluid. So I think the biggest, the most important thing is to keep communicating with your staff, try and create an environment where they feel valued, where they are engaged, where they know they are valued and appreciated. And and you show that not just once a year with a 13th check or, but but on a regular basis. And and I think now's the time for culture to really sort of be not just a, a buzzword, but you know, what is our culture? What is our mission? Why are people here? How are we treating people? So I almost think that employers are, what we've realized as a business, our biggest challenge isn't getting clients to give us business, is to retain our staff. Our staff are our assets more than clients. So, you know, what I would say to any business person who's feeling like their staff are being poached, um, you know, find out what they need. What, what, you know, do stay, conduct stay interviews. Why do you stay here? What can we do to make you happy? Not in a neurotic way and not in a desperate way, but try and work out how can we make our the experience of an employee better in our company, what do they need? Asking questions like, what does freedom and flexibility mean to you? Um, is there anything you don't have here that you would like? Um, what would make you leave? Um, and almost having those preemptive discussions because, I mean, we all know the cost of replacing people, never mind the morale issues, never mind the, the long lead training time and what have you. But I think what we've seen is LinkedIn has become an incredible um, source for, for people to just start looking for staff and poaching. And if you own a recruitment company, all your staff are on, link, are on LinkedIn, obviously, because that's the tool, one of the tools of the trade. So, you know, I think employers who think all my staff are loyal and are not looking are possibly delusional because they might not be looking, but others are approaching them. So, you know, just the fact that they are working on LinkedIn or that they have a profile. And let's be honest, um, a lot of people are open to opportunities. And um, and I think loyalty is, a, is, is different to what we used to think it was years ago. You yeah. know, people used to yeah. think people would stay 10 years. Now, a lot of people say, I was loyal. I was there 18 months and I gave you, I gave you my, my heart and soul, but there's a new opportunity. And as the world opens up and becomes smaller, I think we're going to see more people being more fluid. I, I'm really curious because um, you just recently scheduled a three-month sabbatical, which I'm incredibly jealous of. Uh, <laughs> is this a case of you feel all set, like you could do it tomorrow? Or is this a case of, oh, crap, like now I, now that I've scheduled it, I need to get everything ready so that I can do it when it, when it comes time? I think... 
I think it's been a beautiful combination of a few things that have, have sort of worked together. Um, I was working with an executive coach saying, you know, I've been doing this for years. And, you know, there's that saying, you know, sometimes we get so busy that we, we always like waiting to live. We're always getting ready to live, but we're never really living because we're so busy working. Work now, play later. And and I think that that sense of when will I start living? Because I'm running this business. I'm, I'm helping everybody else. But the kind of work that, uh, the kind of energetic needs that go along with that are immense. You know, doing doing motivational speeches daily or, you know, several times a week, coaching people, inspiring your team, dealing with the needs of a, of a desperate community. Um, they take their toll. So I think I've been working towards this uh, without even realizing it and um, empowering management, empowering my teams, I uh, work with the most incredible people. And there's a uh, beautiful, I think, relationship of trust and respect. So I am very excited about it. And um, I, I would encourage anybody who's who's been in business for a while, if they're feeling a little stale, a little tired, a little worn out, to say, how can I make this happen? And, and then to I think risk uh, to try and avoid the temptation of filling it jam packed that that it's exhausting, you know. So I think it's a tension between wanting to do something exciting and also knowing you need to rest and and fill your tank, you know. So yeah, I'm very excited about that, and it's it's definitely not done as a knee jerk reaction. Uh, I think it's it's I think it will usher in a new way of being because mm -hmm. it'll give me permission to 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 show up in a different way and i think i will get some learnings from that which will maybe help me um become the architect of what this future of my life will be so yeah i would encourage any entrepreneur who who knows that they've been uh giving it their all and feel a little bit stale tired um they know that they they owe themselves a, a gift of rest i would say and and i think many of us have been traumatized since COVID, we've we've dealt with a lot of anxiety, a lot of, you know, trying to hold space for everybody else. And and I think a lot of us maybe owe ourselves this gift of rest, of freedom, of time, freedom. And, you know, um, yeah. And I, I feel if you've got the right people around you, uh, that's that's isn't that why we want to run a business? It's not just to always be the shopkeeper. Right, right. Um, all right, final question, my gratitude question. I'm a big fan of expressing gratitude um, for those who've helped you along the way, especially peers and contemporaries, mentors. We always thank our family, of course. We always thank our team, of course. Of course. But in addition to that, um, who else would you want to just acknowledge for helping you in the journey? You know, I think um, if I if I think about people that I'm close to, I would probably give thanks to my EO forum. I'm part of a forum of seven people and we meet every month for five hours. We connect with each other. We share that 5% that we don't tell the rest of the world. And, and you know, there's a saying that the person you are in five years time will be based on the people you hang around, the books you read, the podcasts, the, you know, everything you listen to. And, um, and if I look at the growth I've had over the last six years, um, having been part of this forum, I think the influence they have had on me has been profound. Um, and it's been done in a very beautiful, gentle way. There's been no advice given, but just the experience shares, the way they show up, um, the the bravery, the the way that, you know, they think bigger than me, um, the way they challenge me, um, and, and this sort of um, dedicated approach to learning that we have, this peer-to-peer -peer group, so I think I, I think the most accelerated growth I've had has been in the last six years, and and I would allocate I'd attribute the the vast majority of that to these six other humans who who share the the truth with me and and hold mine gently as well. So I would say I would encourage anybody to get into um, a, a, whether it's a mentorship group, mastermind group, uh, join a group like YPO or EO or. Um, but just try and work with like-minded people because, you know, they say iron sharpens iron and, and um, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful space not to be lonely. It's a beautiful space to get support, to be challenged and to, um, you know, hold up a mirror in a gentle way. 
So I think that's, that's what I'm most grateful for. Pro talent and pro appointments, uh, how to be unstoppable. How does she do it? It's the name of the books. Uh, where can people go to connect with you and learn more about you, Cindy? Um, they can go to my website, www.cindynorcott.co.za, or they could go to my company website, www.pro-talent.co.za, or they could email me, Cindy, C-I-N-D-Y, at proappoint, P-R-O-A-P-P-O-I-N-T, .co.za. Excellent. Cindy, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast.